Okay, let's talk about the market rate of interest or effective rate of interest. Um, you have to picture, now put yourself in the shoes of a corporation. You decide you're going to issue bonds and you go, you have to, you know, once, once you've made the decision to issue bonds, you've got to set up a lot of things. You've got to set up who is going to underwrite the bonds, who's going to sell the bonds. You know, um, this is, it's not something you decide on one day and you start issuing the next day. A period of time is going to pass here, maybe a month, maybe several months. Okay, you might even have to get a vote in from your shareholders. Whatever the case might be, there's going to be a period of time that passes between when you decide you're going to issue bonds and when you're actually going to issue bonds. Now, let's say at the time you decided that you were going to issue bonds at a 5% interest rate. All right, that was the going rate, uh, that was the going market rate of interest for bonds similar to yours out there in the marketplace, and 5% was a good number to work with. Now, as time passes, that might change. You might wind up that your rate, the market, the rate stated on your bonds or the contract rate on your bonds, winds up being higher or lower than the actual uh, market rate at the time the bonds come out into the world. Okay, so what do I mean by this? If the market rate is the same as the contract rate, right? The market rate out there in the world is the same as the contract rate or the rate stated on your bonds, and you're selling a thousand dollar bond, then you're going to get a thousand dollars when you sell that bond. Now where this gets a little bit fuzzy is what if the rate on my bonds is 5% but other bonds that are similar to mine in the marketplace are actually paying 8%. Why would anybody want to invest with me? Why would anybody give me their money to earn 5% when they could buy somebody else's bond and earn 8%? The way I make this more attractive to the, bond, to the people buying the bonds is I issue my bonds at a discount. I issue it for something less than a thousand dollars. All right, so maybe I, you know, there's there's some math here <laughs> that we're not going to get into. I save that for save that for an upper level accounting class, but there's some math here on how you calculate the, what the discount is going to be. Because ultimately, what you're going to be is you want to be paying these people an eight percent market rate. All right, that's going to be the effective rate of your bond, even though your stated rate on your bond is five percent. You're what you're going to do is you're going to calculate a discount to give you an eight percent rate. So what happens here is you've got this $1,000 bond and you decide you're going to issue it for, let's just say $800. Okay, what's going to happen is somebody's going to pay me $800 and I'm still going to give them a $1,000 bond. All right, I'm still going to pay them interest on a $1,000 bond. I'm still going to pay them $1,000 at the end of the bond period at, the, at maturity. Okay, but the point is, is that at the day that I sell it, if the market rate is higher than my bond rate, I need to sell it for something less than a thousand dollars to make it more attractive. Alternatively, let's do the flip side of it. If the market rate, look again, we're seeing my contract rate is five percent, and if the market rate is something less than that, let's say the market is actually paying out three percent, so my bonds are actually a really good deal. What's going to happen there is now I'm going to make people pay more for my bond. Do you want my thousand dollar bond at five percent and the market's paying three? Then I'm going to make you pay something more than a thousand dollars. And that's how it works. Okay, we're not going to get into any, like I said, any further calculations on uh, discounts or premiums. It's more important to me that you understand the concept and why you would issue a discount or a premium. Okay, so let's look at some journal entries as far as bonds go. On January 1st, 2009, Eastern Montana issued for cash $100,000 of 12% five-year bonds, interest payable semi-annually, market rate of interest 12%. We know we're in a good situation. Market rate is the same as um, our stated rate or a contract rate. If they were different, you would know that you were dealing with some sort of discount or premium. But like I said, we're not going to get into that here in this class. Okay, so here we go. Our journal entry, when we actually begin this, we're issuing for cash $100,000 of 12% five-year bonds. So what's happening on January 1st, 2009? We are simply getting $100,000 in cash, and we're going to have a liability of bonds payable. So our journal entry is going to be a debit to cash and a credit to bonds payable. When we're first getting the cash and setting this thing up, setting this whole bond structure up, we don't care about the 12% interest or anything like that. It, that doesn't get recorded anywhere. On day one, you just record cash and the liability of bonds payable. Now, when we're paying out the bonds, okay, interest, the calculation for interest is always the same no matter what class or where you are. It's always principal, the principal amount of loan of $100,000 times the interest rate. Remember, interest is always stated as an annual figure times time. Okay, and the reason we're using six twelfths here is because this is being paid out. The interest is being paid out every six months on June 30th and December 31st. 
Okay, so if you run this calculation, what this winds up being is it winds up being $6,000. So every June 30th and every December 31st, I have the same journal entry. A debit to interest expense because it's an expense to me and a credit to cash when I pay out that $6,000. Like I said, I'm going to do this same journal entry every June 30th and December 31st until the bond is mature. When the bond is mature, on December 31st, 2013, which is, what, five years later, when I pay it back, I've got my debit to bonds payable because I'm reducing the liability and a credit to cash for the $100,000 I pay out. Okay, Not terribly, terribly complicated. All right, an installment note um, is a little bit di oh, so we're done talking about bonds. Did I mention that? <laughs> installment note is slightly different. Um, an installment note is, well, all right, so let me see what a bond is. A bond is you're paying interest, 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 and then you pay a big amount of principal at the end. Installment notes set up differently in the sense of that you pay interest and principal with every payment that you make. So this is something that's similar to a car loan, not a lease, but like a car loan or a mortgage or something like that. You pay some interest, some principal every single time that you make a payment. So the installment notes, the journal entries, are identical to the bond entries. The only difference is how you're, what you're actually doing in the sense of that you are paying some principal along with some interest. All right, and that completes my coverage of this chapter. There is more information on this chapter. If you want to go into it, that's fine. But as far as what I'm going to test you on, that's pretty much all, all that we're doing for this chapter. All right, have a great night.